This is an extremely high yield review video for anyone preparing for the USMLE Step 2 CK and the USMLE Step 3. This video will focus on the GI system, which is a huge part of the USMLE exams. So if you want to increase your score on exam day, then watch this video until the end. What is the most likely diagnosis in a two-year-old with painless hematochesia and a positive technetium 99 scan? Meckel's diverticulum. Where does technetium 99 concentrate in patients with Meckel's diverticulum? the parietal cells of the diverticulum and stomach. What is the treatment of choice of a pregnant patient who is incidentally found to have gallstones and is asymptomatic? No treatment is needed because most pregnancy-related gallstones Resolve spontaneously within two months of delivery. What is the treatment of choice of a pregnant patient with symptoms of recurrent biliary colic or acute cholecystitis? Cholecystectomy. So it's very important that you take a closer look at how these patients present. In the previous question, we had a pregnant patient and their gallstones were incidentally found and they had absolutely no symptoms. So no treatment was needed. However, in this question, the patient has symptoms of rec recurrent biliary colic or acute cholecystitis. So the treatment or the management of these patients change based on their presentation. Very high yield to know this. What is the treatment of choice of an anal abscess? Incision and drainage. Antibiotics are also needed if the patient has diabetes, immunosuppression, extensive cellulitis, or valvular heart disease. Patients with anal abscesses are at greatest risk of developing which condition? A fistula. Which organism can cause profuse water diarrhea due to germination of spores? C. difficile. So recall that this organism is spore-forming, gram-positive, and an anaerobic bacteria. It releases exotoxins A and B and it is transmitted through the fecal-oral route. Injury to the vagus nerve during gastric surgery can result in which condition? Gastroparesis. What is the next best step in a patient that swallowed a fish bone and experiences Odinophagia. A flexible endoscopy. What is first line treatment for GERD in an infant with appropriate weight gain? Reassurance and lifestyle modification. So this can include upright positioning after feeds, burping during feeds, frequent small volume feeds. It's important to note that GR has peak symptoms at 4 months and self-resolves by age 12 to 18 months. <laughs> 
H2 receptor antagonists like famotidine are indicated in patients with GERD who have poor weight gain, irritable despite lifestyle modifications, or a trial of a diet free of cow's milk. So again, it's important to look at the symptoms or the clinical findings of these patients. So if there's an infant with appropriate weight gain, reducing reassurance and lifestyle modification. But if their weight gain is not appropriate, then you may have to consider giving H2 receptor antagonists. What is the diagnostic test of choice of pyloric stenosis? Abdominal ultrasound. What is the most likely diagnosis in a patient that has periumbilical abdominal pain and diarrhea each time they eat ice cream but have no symptoms when they eat cheese? Lactose intolerance. So this is pretty straightforward, but examiners like to mention different dairy products where their patient may have symptoms when they consume ice cream, but none with cheese. And it's just their way of trying to confuse you and to choose another answer. But basically, cheese and live culture yogurt have less lactose content and tend to cause few or no symptoms. It's also important to recall that celiac disease can also present with GI distress. However, they also present with growth failure and weight loss. A hemodynamically stable elderly patient presents with painless blood per rectum after IV fluids type and cross match what is the next best step in management? Colonoscopy. Recall that diverticulosis patients present with painless hematochesia in an elderly patient. However, for diverticulitis, they have left lower quadrant pain, fever, no blood per rectum, and a colonoscopy is contraindicated due to a risk of perforation. Is the bun to creatinine ratio greater than 20 to 1 in upper GI bleeds? Yes. However, in lower GI bleeds, it is normal. So that's an important fact to remember. Bun to creatinine ratio greater than 20 to 1, think upper GI bleed. If it's a normal ratio, think lower GI bleed. What is the underlying cause of indirect inguinal hernia? Failed obliteration of processus vaginalis. What are the two most common causes of blood streaked stools in a well appearing infant less than six months old? Anal fissures or non IgE mediated food protein induced allergic proctocolitis. It's also important to note that the latter condition is most common in age 1 to 4 weeks. What is the next best step in a breastfed infant who has FPIAP? Recall that FPIAP is... The condition that we just talked about, food, protein, induced allergic proctocolitis. The next best step is to eliminate common triggers from the maternal diet. For example, dairy and soy. 
Soy based formula is not recommended due to the potential cross reactivity between cow's milk and soy protein. What is the next best step in a formula fed infant who has FPIAP? Hypoallergenic hypoallergenic um, formula or hydrolyzed formula. What is the prognosis for patients with FPIAP? Tolerance of offending protein by age one. So typically for these patients, their symptoms resolve within two weeks of dietary elimination of the food allergen. If ultrasound findings are absent or inconclusive for acute cholecystitis, what is the next best step? Hida scan. Which condition causes isolated gastric varices and left sided portal hypertension and congestive sphenomegaly? Splenic vein thrombosis. If a patient presents with clinical features of acute pancreatitis, what is the best next step? in establishing this diagnosis. Serum blood tests only. It's important to note that two of the three are required to diagnose acute pancreatitis. The first being acute onset of persistent severe epigastric pain. Second, elevation of serum lipase or amylase greater than three times the upper limits of normal. Of course, lipase is more specific. And third, characteristic findings of pancreatitis on abnormal imaging, which can be contrast enhanced CT scan or MRI. What is the next best step in management in a patient that does drink alcohol? With clinical features of acute pancreatitis, elevated lipase, and normal abdominal ultrasound. Lipid panel. So, if alcohol or gallstones isn't the cause of acute pancreatitis, then you need to evaluate for hypertriglyceridemia with a serum lipid panel. What is the most likely diagnosis in a patient who is being treated for acute pancreatitis? Then they develop fever, leukocytosis, hypotension, and right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Infected pancreatic necrosis. So to diagnose this condition, you need to do an abdominal CT scan with contrast. And for treatment, you can give meropenem or fluoroquinolone and metronidazole. What is the standard composition of enteral feeding of calorie per kilogram per day and gram per kilogram per day in a patient with adequate baseline nutrition. Thirty calories per kilogram per day and one gram per kilogram per day for protein or protein. Lower calorie intel feeds can also be considered for patients with severe malnutrition in order to prevent refeeding syndrome. What is the best diagnostic test in a patient with rapid onset periumbilical pain, benign exam findings, anion gap metabolic acidosis, 
and a recent MI. Abdominal CT angiography because we're thinking that this patient may have acute mesenteric ischemia. Which artery is most commonly occluded in AMI or acute mesenteric ischemia? The superior mesenteric artery. Which antihypertensives can cause pancreatitis? Thiazides such as hydrochlorothiazide and most loop diuretics such as furosemide. What is the underlying cause of eosinophilic esophagitis? Chronic TH2 mediated inflammatory response triggered by food antigen exposure. What is the treatment of choice of eosinophilic esophagitis? First line treatment is elimination diet of the triggers, PPI. And also topical glucocorticoids, example, for example, fluticasone, sprayed and swallowed. What is the first step in management of infectious gastroenteritis? Rehydration. So typically, if the patient has non-bloody diarrhea, Consider a viral cause, but if they do have bloody diarrhea, then consider a bacterial cause. What vitamin deficiencies may be seen in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Well, these patients typically present with bloating, fatalence, chronic water, diarrhea, and possible signs and features of malabsorption. They have a low vitamin B12 due to bacterial consumption and high folate due to bacterial synthesis. What diagnostic tests can diagnose SIBO? or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Carbohydrate breath testing, endoscopy with jejunal aspirate or culture. What is the treatment of choice of SIBO? Oral antibiotics, for example, rifaximin, ciprofloxacin, and doxycycline. What are risk factors for SIBO? Anatomic abnormalities such as strictures after surgery, motility disorders due to diabetes or scleroderma, immunodeficiency due to IgA deficiency, chronic pancreatitis, or gastric hypochloridia. What would CT scan reveal in a patient with colonic ischemia? Colonic wall thickening and fat stranding. What is the first step in evaluation and management of chronic diarrhea? A comprehensive history. In addition to a comprehensive test and routine lab tests, what other tests should be done to investigate the cause of chronic diarrhea?
Well, that should be in addition to a comprehensive history and routine lab test. Stool for microscopy, electrolytes, and fat content. So chronic diarrhea is loose stool with or without increased frequency for greater than four weeks. What type of anemia is most commonly seen in celiac disease? Microcytic anemia. Is the stool osmotic gap high or low in celiac disease? High. Recall that patients with celiac disease present with greasy, large volume diarrhea and weight loss, as well as osmotic diarrhea. What will GI endoscopy with biopsy reveal in a patient with celiac disease? Villus atrophy, loss of normal villus architecture, increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, crypt hyperplasia. What is the most likely diagnosis in a patient with a history of GERD who presents with dysphagia to solids and no alarm symptoms? Esophageal strictures. How do you manage a patient with celiac disease? A gluten-free diet, treat any nutritional deficiencies present, bone loss prevention, pneumococcal vaccine, and also give Dapsone if dermatitis herpetiformis is present. So some nutritional deficiencies that patients with celiac disease can have include deficiencies of iron, calcium, vitamin D, folic acid, and thiamine. For bone loss prevention, you can obtain a DEXA scan at diagnosis of celiac disease, then repeat the DEXA scan one year later if osteopenia was present. What is the most likely diagnosis in a patient with cirrhosis, mental status changes, and diffuse Abdominal pain. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Extremely high yield to know this. How would the following be affected in a patient with SBP or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis? So the PMNs would be greater than 250, protein less than 1 gram, SAAG greater than 1.1. What is the next best step in management of a patient diagnosed with SBP? IV antibiotics and albumin. So IV albumin is given to decrease the incidence of renal failure and reduce mortality in patients with SBP. Empiric antibiotics are also given most commonly third generation cephalosporins. Also for quinolones, can be given for prophylaxis of SBP. So I had like three different slides on this because this topic is extremely high yield, especially for your, your surgery shelf. It can, you can be seen in your internal medicine shelf and of course on the USMLE exam as well. What is the most likely diagnosis in a 62-year-old 
with occult GI bleeding and small cherry red lesion seen on colonoscopy. Angiodysplasia Angiodysplasia bleeding rates are higher in patients with which condition or conditions? End-stage renal disease, aortic stenosis, and von Willebrand's disease. Why can insulin be used to treat elevated triglyceride levels associated pancreatitis? Well, insulin can be used because it activates lipoprotein lipase, which increases the movement of triglycerides out of the plasma, thus preventing further pancreatic damage. So, if patients have a severe form of this condition, such as fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis, lactic acidosis, or hypercalcemia, you can do apheresis. It's also important that you provide supportive measures such as IV fluids, pain control, and antiemetics. You can also give fibrates such as phenofibrates or gemfibrozil to prevent recurrence. What is the most commonly used calculation to predict 90-day mortality in patients with liver disease. Model for end-stage liver disease or MELD. What values are used to calculate the MELD score? Serum bilirubin. INR, serum creatinine, sodium. So the MELS score has largely replaced the child Pew score, which predicted one to two year mortality. But it's very important that you take a closer look at these different criteria because you can see a clinical scenario where a patient has liver disease and they ask you, which value would indicate the, the mortality for this patient or predicts outcome for this patient with, with liver disease. And they can list different um, lab findings. It's very important that you know that you're looking out for the serum bilirubin, INR, serum creatinine, and sodium. What is the most likely complication in a patient who is hospitalized due to a varicell bleed? Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So to manage these patients, you can give prophylaxis, which is IV ceftriaxone for seven days, then transition to TMP, SMX, or an oral for a quinolone if patient is ready for discharge prior to the completion of the intravenous antibiotic course. So like I said, we need to give seven days of IV ceftriaxone. However, let's say that they are ready for discharge on the fourth day of IV ceftriaxone. In that case, you can switch to oral for quinolone so that they can complete their um, antibiotic course. What is the most common cause of ascites in the United States? Hepatic cirrhosis. How do you calculate the SAAG gradient? Serum albumin minus the acetic fluid albumin. It's very important that you know for the gradient we are subtracting and we are not dividing. 
So serum albumin minus the acidic fluid albumin. SAAG greater than 1.1 indicates what condition? Portal hypertension. What conditions are associated with SAAG greater than 1.1? Congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, alcoholic hepatitis. What conditions are associated with SAAG less than 1.1? Peritoneal carcinomatosis, peritoneal tuberculosis, nephrotic syndrome, pancreatitis, serocytis. So it's very important that you can like name or think of these conditions when you see or you have to calculate an SAAG. So if it's less than 1.1, think of these conditions listed on the screen. However, if it's greater than 1.1, you want to think of CHF, cirrhosis, and alcoholic hepatitis. What tests can be done after four weeks of treatment to confirm H. pylori eradication? Urea breath or fecal antigen testing. It's important to note that H. pylori serology tests evaluate the presence of antibodies which can be present after the eradication of H. pylori. So to evaluate or confirm H. pylori eradication, we would want to avoid H. pylori serology tests and instead do urea breath or fecal antigen testing. What drugs are most commonly used in triple therapy for H. pylori? omeprazole, clarithromycin, and amoxicillin. True or false? Breastfed infants have decreased stool frequency after the first month of life. True. What electrolytes imbalances facilitate hepatic encephalopathy precipitation? hypovolemia, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. So hypovolemia is one of the most common precipitants of hepatic encephalopathy. And for hypokalemia, what this does is facilitate the conversion of ammonium to ammonia. And what the metabolic alkalosis does is decrease the urinary loss of ammonia. So basically, the hypokalemia and the metabolic alkalosis, they really increase the ammonia levels. So it's important to remember this fact that elevated ammonia can lead to hepatic encephalopathy. How often is colonoscopy recommended for patients with FAP who have not undergone prophylactic colectomy? Annual colonoscopy. Patients with greater than 20 millimeters polyps that are removed piecemeal should undergo a second look colonoscopy within how many months? Six months. Five to ten adenomatous polyps less than 10 millimeters, tubular adenomas greater than 10 millimeters, 
villus or tubular villus histology, high grade dysplasia require repeat colonoscopy in how many years? So basically, this question is asking if you see any of these conditions, how often do you have to repeat colonoscopy? Three years. If there are greater than 10 adenomas, how often will colonoscopy need to be repeated? So if you would like me to create a video on the high yield US PTF guidelines, you know, just to prepare for your Yosemite exams or your shelf exams, let me know in the comment section below. But to continue preparing for your exams, all I have to do is click this video right here.